Okay, session seven. The bride's identity in the beauty of the Lord, in the beauty of God. It's very significant uh, that this identity is being established in her understanding early on in the progression. You notice that it's still chapter one and two out of eight chapters. The point being is that it is essential to enter into the intimacy and the knowledge of the Lord. It is essential that we have these introductory realities at least budding and beginning in our lives. It's not an accident that these truths are found in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And many believers get stalled at the very beginning of chapter 1 because they can't get through this issue right here and get it established because the other dimensions that he's dealing with in her life are built upon these realities. We called it the bridal paradigm of the kingdom of God the other day. Let's let's read chapter 1 verse 12 to uh, to 2 7. While the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of Hena blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. Behold, you are fair, or many versions say you are beautiful. My love, behold, you are beautiful. You have dove's eyes. Behold, she responds back to the Lord, you are handsome. My beloved, yes, you're pleasant. And our bed or our couch is green. The beams of our house are cedar. And our rafters are a fir. I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valleys. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down in his shade with great delight. His fruit was sweet to my taste. He brought me to the banqueting table. His banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples because I am lovesick. His left hand is under my head. His right hand embraces me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Overview. She experiences the joy of knowing God's affectionate love and His passionate desire for her. She experiences the pleasure of feeling adorned and beautiful in the grace of God before a beautiful God. This is an exhilarating time in her life. She experiences the superior pleasures that come from understanding the divine romance. The superior pleasures as contrasted to the inferior pleasures of sin, a principle that we've worked on several times. The problem is, in this, in chapter 1 and 2, is that she's not fully balanced. And we'll see that as the book develops in chapter 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, etc. She's still self-absorbed and she doesn't know it. This is to be expected in the early seasons of her spiritual childhood. She thinks of the Lord mostly in terms of her own pleasure instead of what the Lord receives from her. And that's, that's absolutely uh, uh, right and proper at this season of her life. The reason I, I'm pointing this out, and again I'll point it out uh, many a times uh, as the book develops, as the storyline develops in the book, is that many believers never ever get past chapter 1. They, they get stuck about I am dark, and they kind of stutter with I am lovely, and that's about as far as they get. They, they start and stop at chapter 1, verse 5. And what we'll develop is the idea that she is consumed with what she can experience in the Lord. And, and the Lord says, I want you exactly in that place, but I don't want you only in that place in the long term. Eventually, I want you, yes, enjoying me in every season of your life with me, but I want you caught up in doing the will of God as my partner. I want to feed you on more than I love you and you love me. I want to feed you on the will of God in the way that Jesus was fed in John chapter 4. To be energized and exhilarated in doing the Father's plan in partnership with Jesus and the nations and that bridal partnership. To understand that he has an inheritance in her, not only does she have an inheritance in him. 
Now we have everything in its own order. We have to start out understanding our inheritance of the Lord. And the church is, is barely even at the beginning of the beginning of understanding that we have an inheritance in the Lord. We're stuck there and we're, we're really barely introduced in our experience into those realities. But the Lord wants to bring us far beyond that to see that we are actually His inheritance. And there's a whole, uh, uh, there's a, a whole realm of reality in the Lord of, of being caught up in being the Lord's partner in being the inheritance to Him that brings pleasure to His heart. The second revelation of Jesus He's expressing the Father's heart. He's the king sitting at the table expressing the Father's heart. She receives a fresh revelation of what Jesus provided for her through the cross. She says, while the king is at his table, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. So the phrase, while the king is at his table, we're looking at. Jesus the King has expre- expresses the revelation of the affectionate heart of the Father. He's providing a table. Right throughout this passage, there are a number of descriptions that are, that are uh, obviously parallel to the prodigal son coming home to the table, receiving the embrace, the kisses, the crown. Many of the descriptions in this passage are parallel to what happens when Jesus is revealing the heart of the Father to the prodigal who returns. Jesus is feeding her spirit on the revelation of who he is and what he did for her. His table at this point is the revelation of the cross. The king is sitting at his table. And when she's sitting at the table feeding on the table of the Lord, her her worship ascends effortlessly from her. Number three, there's an abundance of food at his table. When we forget the king's table, then our spirit starves. Shame and guilt begin to weigh us down. Many of God's people do not know what it means to sit at the king's table and to feed on the implications of the finished work of the cross. Paul the Apostle said in Romans 6, 13, he says, present yourself to God, listen, as being alive from the dead. Most of us understand the Lord wants us to present ourselves to him. To make ourselves available to him. But he's, Paul the Apostle is adding a condition of which is necessary in presenting ourselves to God. He says, don't just present yourself to, uh, to the Lord. Sincerity and availability is not the only thing the Lord's asking for. But make yourself available in your sincerity to obey him as a person who is alive from the dead. Present yourself in a very specific way. In other words... We worship God, we present ourselves as available to them, as, as Him as one who is fully accepted and embraced in the finished work of the cross and the affections of the Lord. I don't come before the Lord as a shame-driven beggar. I present myself before Him as alive from the dead, as, as wrapped in the robes of righteousness, as the inheritance of Christ Jesus and the Father's plan. In all of His kindness as a tender lamb, He is still a king at the table feeding her. He's not only a lamb, he's also the lion of the tribe of Judah. He roars with great passion. He's a king. The lion and the lamb come together in chapter uh, 1, verse 12. He's a king who causes us to feast on his sacrifice, the great sacrificial table of the Lord. She has her first revelation of Jesus as the king. It's from this kingly authority that he speaks about his affection, and therefore we trust that his plan will prevail because he is a king. The one that says, I love you and make you beautiful, is the king of all of created order. He's not just a romantic who loves you. He's a king that can enforce the implications of his love. He can bring them to pass. The plan will prevail because the one feeding us is the king as well. The theme question In chapter 1, verse 7, remember when she said, Tell me, O you whom I love, where will you feed your flock? Where will you feed me? Is what she asked back in chapter 1, verse 7. It's partially answered in chapter 1, 8 to 11. He's feeding her with the truths of redemption. He's feeding her at the table of the Lord. Her threefold response to the king's provision, to the king's table. 
My spikenard sends forth, sends forth its fragrance. A bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me that lies all night between my breasts. My beloved is to me a cluster of Hena blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. Her fragrant worship ascends to God as perfume. She says, my spikenard sends forth its fragrance. Spikenard is a very costly fragrance. It speaks of her spontaneous worship. She says, the perfume that emanates out of my spirit when I understand the table of the Lord. When I understand what you did for me, the truths that are unfolded in chapter 1, verse 8 to 11 that we looked at in the earlier session. While the king is at his table feeding her on the truths of the cross, her spontaneous worship, her adoration ascends to God as fragrance. Her perfume ascends to God and it ascends to man when she freely receives what the Lord provides. The church at Corinth was one of the most carnal churches in the New, in the New Testament. But Paul declared to the most carnal church in the New Testament... They would have been rivals with the Laodiceans. He declares to them, we are the fragrance of Christ Jesus to God, the most carnal church in his generation. The Laodiceans would have been the, the next generation. In other words, when God smells the fragrance of a believer who is longing to give himself, he smells the literal fragrance of his son, Christ Jesus. Do you know that Jesus has a literal fragrance? So part of his divine personhood the fragrance is literal and all heaven is filled with the fragrances of the lord it's not just symbolic it's the lord uses his fragrance in a symbolic way but it's actually literal the lord has many fragrances about his person that a fragrance is sweet to the lord and paul tells the corinthians god through us through the corinthians he's saying diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge everywhere we go. The sweetness of God draws people. Now here he's not talking about a fragrance that is discernible by the natural. There are obviously those times when the Lord's fragrance is manifest in a supernatural way. Here he's talking about the sweetness of the Lord, but Paul understands the very fragrance of the Lord as a part of our, of our uh, experience in redemption in the age to come. The fragrances of the Lord are a part of who we are in redemption. They're, they're spiritual in this age and spiritual and literal, natural, if you will, in the age to come. We are to God the very fragrance of Christ. Can you imagine that statement? We are to God. We smell to God what Jesus smells like in redemption. Beloved, I don't know if you understand what Paul just said there in this passage. We are to God, to God, not just to people, the, to people as well, the very fragrance, the aroma of the Son of God. It's a staggering reality. When the Lord, when the revelation of His table touches us, our perfume ascends spontaneously and effortlessly to the Lord. It's adoration, it's worship, it's those those driving down the road, oh, I love you, God, coming out of your spirit. That's, you, that's the spikener descending forth out of your spirit when you're feasting at the king's table. The bridal paradigm of the kingdom, just a, again, not a theological term, just a term I use in a practical way. Those truths awaken such a response of adoration that it will spontaneously begin to flow out of your spirit. It's not just grit your teeth and have a prayer time. These truths transform us and change our emotional chemistry. What kind of fragrance is coming forth from your spirit? What does God see when he looks at you? What does he smell when he looks at you? And I'm not talking about the, what, what many might think, the fragrance of being committed or not. I'm not talking about that issue of, it, of the fragrance of the Lord. I'm talking about confidence right now in his redemption, not commitment to obey him. Of course, I, it, it implies commitment to obey him. But what a lot of people have is the, the stench of religious striving. They can never uh, come to a place of confidence. They, they never add confidence to their sincerity. They're available and sincere, but their, their, uh, uh, their spirit is, is broken down in lack of confidence in redemption when they come before the Lord. 
He doesn't just want the, co- the, the fragrance of obedience. He wants the fragrance of confidence. He wants confidence added to our sincerity. The revelation of the cross causes great anxiety. Prayer effortlessly comes out of our spirit in this context. Many of God's people are overwhelmed and overcome with condemnation and accusation. They feel no security, no, no confidence in the presence of the Lord. Therefore, they can't really enter into worship. They can grit their teeth and do tasks, but with a free spirit, they, never, they can never really open their spirit to the Lord in that boundless confidence of the lover of God. It's part of the divine romance. B. She understands the abundance of Jesus' sufferings on the cross. She says, a bundle of myrrh is my beloved to me. Myrrh is a sweet perfume which speaks of the sweetness that comes out of his death. Myrrh is an expensive, or it was in that day, an expensive embalming fluid. If you, if you want to use our terminology, they, they, they used myrrh uh, in, at, at a burial. And I'm, obviously they didn't have embalming flus, but I wanted you to get the idea. They put those in the graves. It often, it spoke, it speaks of the suffering of death. It's a very costly and expensive and a strong perfume. It was only used by the wealthiest people. Jesus was born, when he was born, myrrh was presented to him as one of the prophetic gifts, which spoke of his death, his atoning death. When he died, he was buried with myrrh. It's uncommon for a woman to have a necklace of myrrh. She's describing a necklace with myrrh hanging around her neck. That was an uncommon gift that Solomon had given her. A bundle of myrrh speaks of his death as an abundant death. It's a bundle of myrrh. It speaks of the abundance that was accomplished and what he endured. The, it's not so much what he, uh, what he accomplished, it's what he endured. It's the abundance of what he said yes to. It's the, he said yes to the myrrh of God, to the suffering death upon the cross. When she said, you, she, she actually inferred, she's calling him, you are a bundle of myrrh. What she's saying is, I understand the abundance of your suffering. I understand what it cost you a little bit, and therefore what I mean to you that you would do this. One of the greatest statements about your value is what Jesus endured for us. The uncreated God becomes a human, crushed by the wrath of God. Who are you anyway? That's the point. She does the math. She does the spiritual logic. She says, for you, the God of Genesis 1, to take upon yourself the garments of humanity, to be crushed by the wrath of God, the abundance of your suffering, the measure of what you endured in your death, you are an abundance of myrrh to me. Therefore, I must be very, very, very important to you. Of course, one of the most significant Realities of our value is one that is, is uh, often overlooked. The very fact that we exist. The very fact that God did design you and create you is a massive statement of value and of divine intention of who you are. And then the fact that He redeemed you. That out of the very Godhead came redemption. Beloved, the value that she begins to see about her life in the abundance of myrrh. She consistently meditates upon the cross. She goes, it lies all night between my breasts. The myrrh lies all night upon her heart. It's permeating her spirit. She meditates upon it on her bed. She's talking about the consistent meditation of the myrrh of God that is implied and spoken of in the cross. She ponders on the revelation of the Lord's death until it becomes a part of her. She is presenting herself to God. She's available and sincere, but as one alive from the dead, as one that has the value of God upon her life, that has the garments of redemption upon her. She doesn't present herself to God as a slave. She presents herself to God as a queen, as an inheritance, as one adorned in the grace of God, as one fully alive from all of the implications of death. She presents herself as God's favorite. That's 
One of my favorite little uh, uh, terms that I believe every believer has the right to use. Here I am, Lord, your favorite. It's me again. That's how we present ourselves to the Lord. That's what she's doing. This whole, whole section, she's presenting herself to God alive from the dead versus in condemnation, in shame, and in unbelief and in fear as though the Lord's about to cast her aside. We will never, never grow confident in redemption. No, we will never, ever mature without confidence in our redemption. Through the night, she meditates. The night might mean the night time of, of her weakness and temptation. The night might mean longevity. Literally through the night, it's consistently is the idea. She goes, I carry this even in the dark time of my life. I meditate, it's on my heart, all through the difficult periods, through the long, it also implies longevity and consistency, through the night. Never ceasing is the idea, I feed upon this reality. Jesus is the myrrh of God to my heart, it rests upon my heart all the time. Another concept, I mean the idea is that she's established in confidence in redemption. Her third response her first one is the spike nerd. Her spontaneous adoration when she feeds at the king's table. Her second response is to meditate on the myrrh of God. The measure of suffering that Jesus endured at the cross. I don't mean just in the three hours of hanging there when the darkness fell upon the land. I mean in just... Bigger than that, the whole plan of God, what it meant for the uncreated God to become a person, be, I mean to become a human and be crushed by the wrath of God. Her third response, my beloved is to me a cluster of Hena blooms. Jesus is to her as a cluster of lovely Hena flowers filled with sweet fragrances. In other words, he's not a burdensome God, he's a sweet and delightful to her. When we understand by revelation his personality, when we know who He is, we say to Him, You are the cluster of Hena blooms. Religion has offered the people the image of a burdensome, angry God. He's not burdensome and angry at His people. We have this image that He's always on the verge of, about, of impatience, always at the line. He's going to give us one more chance, and then, then we're all finished. He doesn't... He deals with rebellion very differently than he deals with sincerity. Again, the context of the entire book, every one of these passages, is in the context of sincerity. And her sincerity has already been established in the very introductory verses. And so she needs confidence with her sincerity to result in mature passion for God. Sincerity is essential. But confidence before the Lord in her weakness produces maturity of passion with her sincerity. We must preach with a full heart on the gracious God who's filled with kindness. We must be able to say, He is to me the cluster of Hena, of Hena blooms. He is a fragrant and sweet God that intoxicates my heart. That's the image of Christ Jesus that we present to the people. The verse from Romans chapter 2, Paul the Apostle said, do you despise the riches of his kindness, of his goodness, the riches of his forbearance, the riches of his long suffering? Don't you know that the goodness of God is designed to lead you to abandonment to God? That's the essence of what he's saying. I believe that we err if we go right to repentance. I believe repentance, we pull those weeds out of that hard ground after we have watered the ground properly with the revelation of who God is. We water the garden and the, you can pull the, the roots. I mean, you can pull the weeds from the roots, roots and all, easily in a moist ground in a garden. Paul the Apostle says the problem is that they are despising, they're taking lightly the richness of God's kindness to them. And th he says, don't they understand that the coming into an experience of his kindness produces repentance? It produces the willingness to be abandoned to God. You can only shake people over hell on a rotten stick so long <laughs> before it ceases to motivate them. A lot of places stress repentance. I tell you, a people 
who were trying to bring it to deep repentance without the knowledge of the, of the cluster of Hena blooms, the fragrant delightfulness of our God. Repentance will only go so far. I mean, we can, we can get people to do nearly anything for maybe three months. If we warn them and threaten them, they can do almost anything for three months. But they will not do long and lasting, embrace long and lasting obedience in secret, under pressure, in the long term, without a a right knowledge of who God is. I'm not interested in filling the prayer meetings for three months. I'm interested in a people for decade after decade when nobody's watching under pressure, pressing into God. That's when the first commandment is truly restored in the first place. She is a cluster of Hena blooms in the vineyards of Engedi. And the vineyards of Engedi had the greatest gardens, the greatest vineyards with fragrance anywhere in Israel. They speak of the most intense fragrance imaginable at that time to those people. She's saying, Jesus has more beauty and fragrance than anything that I can even imagine. He's like a cluster, the diversity of his fragrances. He's not just a flower, he's a cluster. There's a multitude. There's an abundance. There's a diversity of his fragrance. It's like the vineyards in Engedi, the vastness of the fragrances that that they could that a a bypasser could smell as they walked by the vineyards of Engedi. Okay, the principle of worshiping God without a guarded spirit. John the Apostle touches this. He he talks about the fact that believers have boldness in the day of judgment. What an amazing, amazing reality. When the full wrath of God is being revealed, the church will have boldness on that day. How much more should we have boldness now? When the wrath of God is restrained, when it's fully unveiled, we will stand bold on on that day. The fullness of our redemption will be made fully clear to us. And John's talking about how love is perfected. He says love is perfected, or when we understand the love of God in, in a proper way, it drives fear out of the relationship, or it drives uncertainty or the fear of rejection. He's not talking about the fear of the Lord. He's talking about condemnation, shame, and the fear of rejection. It's driven out of the relationship. Why? Because the fear of rejection brings torment to any relationship. Any human relationship where there is the fear of rejection, it torments the relationship. And my point is this. Many of God's people, sincere and available. I mean, their commitment is, is, uh, is uh, they, could, they could not be more sincere. But they have torment in their relationship with God. They worship God. They'll go, to, they'll go to all-night prayer meetings. They'll do anything for God. But their spirit is closed when they're before the Lord. They have torment in their relationship with the, with the Lord. It's called a spirit of rejection and condemnation. It's called shame. It's called not feeding at the king's table. It's understanding that Jesus is the religious God of the Pharisees. He's not the cluster of Hena blooms in the the vineyards of Engedi. She says, you're not like that. You're filled with fragrance and beauty. You well my heart continually. I know who you are. You can be in a worshiping environment, but if you're presenting yourself to God as somebody under condemnation instead of presenting yourself to God as one alive from the dead... Though the Lord will esteem your sincerity, your spirit is closed and you cannot grow effectively in the Lord. I've seen people 10, 20, 30 years later, their spirit is still closed when they go before the Lord. Just the the, uh, fundamental confidence of being the fragrance of God is something that's not been established. It's a very, very, very common uh, 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 reality in the body of Christ. Okay. The revelation of her beauty to God. She says, behold, you are fair. He says to her, behold, you are fair. Put the word beautiful. You are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. He's looking at her. Now, remember her struggles earlier in in chapter 1, verse 5 and 6 and 7. She's struggling, right? The five descriptions we gave in that session. The unkept vineyard. The sons are angry. She's lost her way. She's like a veiled woman. She serves at a distance. 
The Lord looks at her as he's feeding her at the table, and her spirit is beginning to just worship is ascending like spike nerd. It's just flowing out of her. She's going, oh, I love you. I love you. I, I never knew this was how it was set up, Lord. I, I didn't understand this, but the king's feeding her at her table, and her perfume is ascending before the Lord. Her, her confidence and her love is flowing, even in her immaturity is what's happening. Because torment's out of the relationship, and he looks at her right in the eyes, and he says, so you think that my food is good at my table? You think that I am a fragrant Hina Bloom? You see the bundle of myrrh of what I paid for you and what you mean to me? Well, let me add something to it. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. And she's just, it's just stunning her heart as the revelation of the beauty of the Lord is touching her spirit. Not the Lord's beauty, her beauty in the Lord is what's going on. In this season, Jesus is very purposefully combining two aspects of the bridal paradigm to emphasize to her. He's speaking of her beauty and he's speaking of his affection. He's saying you're beautiful and he's saying you are my love. I love you and you're beautiful. You look good and I like you. You look good and I like you. You look good to me and I like you. Over and over and over. We feel dirty. We feel shame. He says, you look good and I like you. And she's thinking, which I'm jumping ahead in verse 16. She just says, okay, well, you're beautiful too. I like you. And that's exactly what this revelation produces in our spirit. I'm getting ahead of myself. As long as we feel dirty or shamed, we'll draw back. We will live dirty. We will live in shame. A person that feels dirty will live dirty at the end of the day. Even a sincere believer that feels dirty in the Lord's presence will eventually, I mean, will the rule of their life, when no one's looking, under pressure, in private, over the long haul, they'll live, in, they'll live dirty. But an immature believer that feels beautiful and loved, they feel like they look good and they're liked, they run to him. They just run right into his arms. Again, I'm not talking about the rebellious spirit here. The whole context of the book is the sincere. I'm talking to the sincere. I'm talking to the people who want to go all the way. They're sincere as can be, but they, the Lord wants to establish confidence in the presence of the Lord that flows out of the revelation of His beauty and of our beauty and redemption. Jesus now adds to her threefold experience. In verse 12 to 14, and what we just read, 12 to 14 She's feeding at his table, and it's impacting her. Her her perfume is ascending. She sees the measure of his suffering and therefore her value. She sees the fragrance of the Lord. He's a good-looking God to her, if you will. A fragrant God, a sweet God. He's not the God of the Pharisees. He's the God the little children ran past the Pharisees to embrace. That's the God that she sees. The God, you know, is like I always imagine the children walking up. I've said this many times. They, they have three responses. They look at the scribes and Pharisees and they go, ugh. They looked at their face and says, no way. And they looked at the 12 and they said, ah, maybe. They're, those 12 are iffy. You know, the 12 are kind of like, <laughs> come here, you little. And so, uh, but they looked in the eyes of Christ Jesus and they ran right up and embraced, embraced his neck. He wasn't sure about the twelve. They had wanted nothing to do with the Pharisees. But something about the countenance of Jesus, the children ran up to him. She experiences new depths of worship, a constant meditation on her value that is, again, the fruit of his abundant suffering. It's, it's implied by his abundant suffering. He suffered because we're valuable. This very necessary groundwork of verse 12 to 14 before she can accept a far more difficult truth. And a far more difficult truth is you are beautiful, you are beautiful, you look good, and I like you. The truth of her beauty to God, this truth is applauded in a very quick, yet a very superficial way. I don't know of anybody who draws back conceptually from the truth that they're, they're beautiful in the Lord's sight. I mean, yeah, in, in redemption, people go, oh, that's neat. However... It is not easily grasped in the heart, this truth. It takes God to reveal this. We have a natural resistance, a natural religious resistance to this truth. Even though we like the idea of it, it's difficult to grasp 
in the private prayer life. We must not be, be content until God's people can say in private prayer with the spirit of liberty, I am beautiful to you, Christ Jesus. I am not happy until people can, when no one's looking, I am beautiful and feel right. Most people can hear that as a teaching and go, wow, underline it, tell their friend to get the tape and everything, but it never gets into their prayer life alone with God because it's scandalous for them to actually say it with meaning and with boldness. They go, the apostles are beautiful. I want to be beautiful. I will be beautiful in heaven. That's it. I want to be and I will be. They cannot say what the Lord said to her. They cannot turn it back around. Thank you for the beauty that I possess in you right now in my immaturity. They just can't say that. They can't say things like, I am your favorite. I am the one the Lord loves. I am the disciple the Lord loves. I am the one who loves God. Those words just chafe them when they say them in their private life. Again, they can underline them. They can tell their friends about them. They can give them the tape by the book, but they can't say that in private. There's a natural religious resistance in our heart to these things. It's a, far, it's a difficult truth. Again, it sounds good, but it lives in the heart with difficulty. It takes God to reveal this, but that's why we're sowing these truths. It's very essential to this place of, the, of her uh, progression. He speaks, he's prophesying over her, or he's speaking in the Spirit. He says, you have dove's eyes. And there's uh, quite a few things related to dove's eyes, but in a very uh, summary fashion, a dove obviously is a picture of the Holy Spirit through the Scripture. But a dove does not have peripheral vision. They've, they've, uh, I, I've read this, obviously. I, I, I can only know this through books. I don't have any firsthand experience with doves <clears throat> a lot of people do actually and they you could come by a dove and make a motion in their peripheral vision and they're not distracted they don't even see it they can only see straight ahead they do not see peripherally like many other birds would you just move your hand and they jump and they're gone but a dove doesn't even see it they only see straight ahead and a dove has another unique dimension a dove only mates with one other dove their whole life if their mate dies it's a strange uh, fact of, of nature. They never, ever mate again. They're, they're known. It's a, it's a curious fact about them for their loyalty. They speak of guilelessness, of clear vision. They speak of loyalty. He's speaking about her vision. And her dove's eyes are, 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 are uh, functioning in the truth that she sees in verse 12, 13, 14, and 15. It's those things that he's referring to. He says, you're beginning to see with clarity what I'm telling you. You're beginning to see in a way that brings you confidence. You're seeing the kind of God I really am. I really am a God of Hena blooms. I am a God that's fragrant and beautiful. And you're understanding you're beautiful to me. You're beginning to see it. I see it in you. You have does eyes. You have the Holy Spirit perspective of your life and of the kingdom of God and what I'm doing. I'm a lover producing lovers. I'm a romantic drawing a bride to myself. You understand what I'm about. I'm a beautiful God imparting beauty. I'm a fragrant God putting my fragrance on my people. He says, you understand, you're beginning to understand. You have dove's eyes. You're at the beginning of understanding. Her threefold response to her beauty and God's affection. Her threefold response her, to her new discoveries of her beauty. To the fact of the things that God, the fact that God has just said you're beautiful. This is her response to her discovery of her beauty in the Lord. She turns it around. Behold, you are beautiful, Jesus. You are beautiful. You're more than fragrant. You're more than willing to die to pay an outrageous price for me. And you are more than one that feeds me well. See, she starts off. She's, she's just growing. She starts off. You feed me well at your table. My spirit resonates. You smell good to me. You're, 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 you allure my heart. And I see what you were willing to, to endure for me. Now she goes further. She says, you're beautiful. He says, and there's such pleasure I experience in this dialogue. He's saying, you're beautiful, and she's speaking it back. There's a beautiful romance in the gospel that's going back and forth. I call it the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 
God the Holy Spirit is empowering her to feel God's love for her and empowering her to love God back. I tell you, that romance, when He speaks, then our heart speaks, then, then He speaks, then we speak, and the Spirit of God empowers us to feel both dimensions of truth. Oh, I love it when I can feel a little bit when God says, I like you when you look good. And I love it when I feel just a little bit when I say back to God, I like you and you look good. Oh, I love to love God and I love to be loved by God. And that's what's going on throughout this whole dialogue. It's the romance. It's going back and forth. It takes God to feel God's love from Him and it takes God to love God back. We understand that. She says, you're handsome, you're beautiful, you're pleasant. Okay. Her revelation of Jesus' beauty. And of her pleasures, her spiritual pleasures in Jesus. You're handsome. Number one, my beloved, which means I love you. Number two, and number three, and it's so delightful to live with you, Jesus. I enjoy walking with you, Jesus. It's pleasant to walk with you when I understand you. See, in verse 15, he says, You look good and I like you. She turns it around. Well, you look good and I like you. And this is really a pleasant life in the Spirit. Doesn't mean the circumstances are easy. I'm not talking about easy circumstances right now. I'm talking about her spirit is resonating. Her heart is is, is, uh, energized in this two-way dialogue. His loveliness penetrates her spirit. He is becoming more beautiful to her the more that she sees and understands what she is to him. It's very, very significant. She, it's, it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's, however you say it, the, the principle, the rich get richer. <laughs> Jesus said, to him that has, I will give even more besides. To the person that sees a little bit, they see more. They're prepared. The soil's prepared. To the person that sees that they look good to God and God likes them, they, God looks better to them and they like God more. It just, the rich get richer. To him who has, Jesus says, I give more besides. Some, some, uh, uh, some people in the right here are just beginning to get the image of a God that, that is sweet in his fragrance. They haven't come to the they're not bold about the fact he's beautiful and fascinating. He's, it's just the idea that he's not the God of the Pharisees. It's like, wow, this could be really good. It, they're just at the, you are a flower, not really that good of a flower yet, but I'm starting to see you differently. And there is a progression in this whole thing. We don't start from bad image of God to a stunning revelation of the beauty of the Lord in one day unless the Lord appears in an open vision. There's a progression. She now feels beautiful and feels loved by the Lord. And she says, well, I now am prepared to see your beauty in a way I never could. You're more than fragrant. You more than you feed me well. And you more than you are willing to endure much for me. Your beauty is stunning to me. He says, you're handsome and I love you. He goes, I love you like I've never loved you. And it's so pleasant. This interchange, this romance of the gospel is so pleasant. Okay. Her abundant rest and security in Jesus. She says, behold, you're handsome. Yes, pleasant. And our bed is green. The bed or the couch, the New American Standard says, I have it written there, is the bed or the couch of the Lord speaks of rest and security. There's no fear of judgment, no fear of rejection. She's in total rest. New American Standard translates it, our luxuriant couch. They're resting together on a luxuriant couch. The New King James says it's green. The New American calls it luxuriant. It speaks of abundance. The couch of the Lord is plush and green. It's filled with life. It's not parched. The couch of the Lord, the place of rest, isn't a desert parched land. It's life flowing. There's there's abundant. Uh, the, The rest of God is abundant is what she's saying. Okay, her eternal house of intimacy, fragrance, and security. She says, the beams of our house are cedar, and our rafters are of fir. The beams and the rafters provide the structure for their house. They're made of hard and strong and fragrant wood. 
she sees now that their house together is strong and fragrant. The house of the Lord is built securely with strong and hard wood. In other words, it's not going to rot. It's not going to decay. It's not going to break down under pressure. It's safe. It lasts forever. It's beautiful. It's fragrant. The house of the Lord is a sure thing. And she sees that it's our house. It's our dwelling together. We will dwell together in beauty and strength and fragrance forever and forever is what she's declaring to him. And we develop those ideas. Okay. Her identity is Jesus' beautiful inheritance. I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valleys is what she confesses. She discovers a deeper dimension of who she is. She's now proclaiming her second confession. Her first was first one is I'm dark but lovely. And I have that in the paragraph we didn't read. Now she's saying... It's a twofold confession here. I am the rose and I am the lily. This is her highest identity as the bride of Christ. This revelation can only be discerned by having the foundation of chapter 1, verse 12 to 17. I have never seen a person be able with meaning and truth to say, I am the rose and I am the lily until they've been able to touch the truths in verses 12 to 17 of chapter 1. They don't have to use the language of Song of Solomon, but they must touch the truths. This is her highest identity. It's just beginning to touch her. She only grasps the introductory beginning of this. It's not until chapter 4, verse 8, till he says it boldly, you are my bride. He says it in a way that's profound, even beyond right here. This is her introductory discovery. She's beginning to connect with what's happening. Some commentaries say Jesus is the rose and the lily, and others say the bride is. I'm convinced that it's the bride for a number of reasons. I'm going to uh, make some uh, uh, appendix articles uh, because there's so many things that we're studying that we can't go into details, and I will develop that, but I've, it's a subject I've spent quite a bit of time on, and to me it's unmistakable that, that the bride that the, that the maiden is speaking here i am the rose i'm understanding who i am right now and then uh, to be in the very next verse jesus identifies the lily as the bride she says i'm the rose and the lily that's the same one and then the next verse jesus says you are the lily the, the the one that is the rose and the lily is the same person and jesus identifies it as the bride The confession of being the rose is more than the fact she's lovely and desired. It's more than she looks good and God likes her. It's more than that now. It's gone up a significant level. She's saying more than I look good to you and you like me. She's saying to Jesus, I am the inheritance that the Father has given you for eternity. It's more than I look good and you like me. I mean, the angels look good and I have no doubt he likes the angels. But they are not the inheritance of Christ Jesus. Her identity is the only pure lily, the only pure bride. She says, I'm the lily of the valley. It's more than a rose, and I have quite a page or two on the rose there. I am the lily. She, lily speaks of purity. She's saying, I'm the only thing pure in this fallen world, the lily of the valley. The only pure thing in the valley of this dark world is the redeemed. When God looks at the fallen world, he sees shining purity coming from one place. He's seeing it out of the grace of God in the midst of the redeemed. He sees the robes of righteousness. He sees the purity of the sincere yet immature bride. We develop that a, a, a bit here. Okay, her unique value and beauty to him. Jesus is now affirming her confession when she said, I'm the rose and the, and the lily. He says, like a lily among the thorns, you are the lily. You are that lily. He's speaking it to her directly now. He's affirming that she has this position of unique purity. And again, the purity that she's walking in right now is not the purity of a mature life. That's not what she's talking about right now. It's not what the Lord's talking about. She is going to deny the Lord. In verse 17 of chapter 2, and a little bit down the road, he's looking at her in redemption right now. He's looking at her in the way he sees her in the court of God. He's not calling her mature in any way at all right now. She's going to have some discipline and some struggles later on. We're going to touch it even in this session. 
He's talking about the, the four ways of which we, our beauty is established in the Lord's sight. We looked at in the earlier sessions. The robe of righteousness, the willing spirit, etc. So don't misunderstand this. She has a long way to go. She's at the beginning. She has seven chapters to go still. She's at the beginning of her journey here. Now she's beginning to understand his unique value and his unique beauty. She says, like an apple tree, among the trees of the woods, so my beloved among all the sons, of all the men of the earth, of all the other human beings, you are the refreshing apple tree among all the, of all the, the, uh, the trees of the woods. And the, and the wood is often in the Old Testament symbolic of humanity for a number of reasons. And she's saying that you are the refreshing person from all of history. You are that one. Again, obviously, I'm, I'm giving you much more than we can cover because I want you to meditate and work on it. Not uh, These sessions are to stir you up so you leave going, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get a hold of this. You can't get it in a session like this. This is only an, uh, you're just reading the menu right now. Okay. She says, I sat down in his shade with great delight. She's sitting in his shade. She's not standing in her own religious effort. She's in his shade. And the delight and the pleasure she feels, and she's, she's young and immature in the Lord, his shade is refreshing. She didn't produce that shade. She's resting in his shade. You can't produce the shade to refresh yourself. You can't relate to God on the basis of your maturity and be refreshed. What I mean by that, a lot of us, if we have a good week, we have confidence. If we have a bad week, we, we, we have fear of rejection. We relate to the Lord on the basis of our own maturity. Again, when we feel like we're doing good, we have confidence. We feel doing bad, we, we draw back. We're trying to rest in our own shade. We can't do it. There's only one shade tree that you can sit in, and it's his shade, and it will bring delight to the inner man. It will cause the beginning of the superior pleasures of the gospel. The Lord's wooing her. Okay. I sat down in the shade with great delight. His fruit was sweet. She goes, oh, I love what's happening. She says, not only do I have delight, it's the two phrases, great delight and sweet fruit. She's refreshed in shade. So in this resting in the shade, great delight and sweet fruit. That's the superior pleasures in her language. She loves to love God, and she loves to be loved by God, and she's immature. She loves gazing at the introduction to his beauty, and she loves feeling beautiful before him. She goes, oh, I love this. I love it. I love it. She's at the app. She's under the shade tree, on the couch, in the house, on the bed, just loving everything. She's got her vineyard worship tapes. You know, oh, I love you, God. She's just enjoying the Lord. She experiences God's enjoyment of her. There's no greater pleasure available to the human spirit than when we feel enjoyed by God and then we are empowered to enjoy Him in response. Oh, it's a wonderful reality. We develop the sweet fruit dimension of the kingdom of God. The sweet fruit. The Lord wants it to be sweet. The internal experiences. I'm not saying the external circumstances are easy right now. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in her spirit, she's resonating in her communion with the Lord. Okay, he brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me is love, was love. The older versions uh, of the Bible call this the wine house. She's celebrating in the house of wine before the Lord. The, the wine of God is flowing. She says, oh, I love this. This table is the, be- is, is the beginning of the table in Revelation 19. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb, and I developed that idea. The flag over her life is the love of God. That's how she defines her life. I just, again, I'm just letting you know it's here. You're not going to get it by hearing it one time. I'm just letting, I'm advertising the, the notes to you. It's really what, all, all I'm really doing. I'm trying to get you hooked up to them where you go, you know, I didn't, I don't remember it, but boy, I'm going to go read that. I'm going to go work on that. Then if you get this into your prayer language, then it works. 
She cries out for deeper in intimacy. She says, sustain me and refresh me. I'm lovesick. She goes, oh, I'm at your table. I define my life under the flag of the love of God. And I give four ways how she defines her life under the, the banner of love. She goes, sustain me, refresh me, give me more, give me more. I want more, I want more. And that's always what happens when we understand these truths. Nobody, I believe, can understand these truths with a, with a sincere heart without saying, give me more, sustain me and feed me, refresh me. I'm lovesick, more, more, more. They become ravenous in their appetite for more of God. That's what happens. Verse 5 comes out of the other verses. There's a progression. Then in verse 6, it says, look at that. God's embrace. She understands the twofold activity of the Lord. The right hand and the left hand of God. The left hand is the invisible activity of the Lord. The right, the things she cannot see, she recognizes. Many things she can't see, the Lord has provided. And the right hand are the things that she can see. And she thanks God for both of them. And then what happens in the last verse, in verse 27, is that the Lord tells the daughters, He says, I don't want her disturbed right now. He says, I have her in isolation. I'm feeding her. I'm making her lovesick. She's not doing a thing. She's sitting around eating and listening to music all day. That's all she's doing right now. She's resting under these. She wants apples, grapes, the wedding. She didn't do a thing yet. Don't disturb her. This is the season I have her in right now. Do not disturb her. We'll talk about uh, this in the, at the, after the break. He then comes in verse 8 and disturbs her. It says now it's time to change seasons. We'll look at that when we come back. Amen. Let's stand. Oh, the king is at his table. When he's at his table... My perfume sends forth its fragrance when you're feeding on the realities of who you are before him. Oh, you're the I love you. The perfume just comes out of you effortlessly. You don't have to look at the prayer list and say, oh, yes, I love you. Yes. Number two, you are good. It just it just spontaneously flows out of you. It strikes your heart and unlocks your heart. These truths unlock you. And your perfume ascends effortlessly out of you. And when you begin to understand this in the progression again, it grows and grows and grows right through this session. Then she goes, I want more. Sustain me. Refresh me. I'm sick with love. I love, I love, I love. And the Lord says, leave her alone. Don't disturb her right now. I'll disturb her later. Because the Lord's going to come and really shake her up in the next session. And so let's just take one session at a time here. Lord, we love you. Oh, we love to love you. Lord, we say you are a bundle of myrrh. You are a bundle of myrrh to us that lies upon our heart at all times. Oh, the measure of what you endured for us. Oh, fragrant God. You are not the God of the Pharisees. You are the fragrant God. You are the Hena blooms. Oh, the measure of what you endured for us. Feed me, oh God. Feed me at your table, oh great King. We know that you will enforce this great plan of redemption because you are the king and none can stop you. None can hinder this plan for you are the king that feeds us from this table. Lord, draw us after you and let us run together into your embrace. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.